Okay, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for the introduction and also the opportunity to speak here. Uh, this is my first recount, and I think it has been really great. Um, and um, uh, I hope to also uh, come back again. So, um, my uh, talk is uh, really on uh, using uh, variational autoencoders. Um, and this is something that this is one of the things we do in my lab. Uh, and, and for um, using them for uh, data integration. And we have uh, been doing that, or we've been learning about that and trying this out for some time. Uh, uh, both, also we kind of started out doing this uh, on uh, microbiome data. Uh, then last year we were working on a, a data set with um, uh, both the genetics and also some health data on the uh, 40,000 individuals that we um, uh, published as well. And for those, um, for those uh, um, papers, what we mainly did was use it to uh, integrate the data and also to, to do some ana uh, analysis uh, of the latent space. What I will talk about today is uh, our latest paper, uh, um, which is uh, where we kind of take this even further. So we use, we, we add in, or we use, actually use the generative model of the VAE, and we also uh, and we add that, uh, this with uh, virtual uh, per perturbations. And this is really work uh, by Rosa, who is now a postdoc in Barcelona, and also uh, uh, Ricardo uh, uh, from my group. So, um, what we did, or what we had, was uh, uh, a very nice uh, type 2 diabetes cohort with a lot of uh, multimodal data, uh, all kinds of data uh, that had been uh, um, generated on these individuals, so everything from genomics to the gut microbiome. We also had um, uh, various clinical data, uh, uh, clinical measurements of both of the blood uh, from scans and so on, and also which uh, drugs they have been uh, using. Um, and then finally, we also had a lot of in environmental data. And this was, was uh, for a total of uh, almost uh, 800 patients. So. We kind of divided this into uh, 10 different uh, uh, groups of data. So um, uh, three groups that were uh, ca categorical with around 450 features and then uh, uh, around 8,000 features which were uh, across the different um, data sets which were uh, con uh, continuous. So um, what we wanted to do with this was really to try, can we learn across all the data? Uh, instead of just trying to learn from one data set um, at a time. And what we knew from our previous uh, work was that we could use these uh, variation autoencoders, VAEs, to integrate it. But what we also really had to uh, try to solve here or to, uh, to tackle was that we had to make sure we could do effective data fusion across all these data. The, this is like uh, a cohort that has been uh, collected all over Europe or with uh, in individuals from all over Europe, so there's lots of biases in terms of how the data have been collected, and also there's a lot of missing data. And finally, we're also interested in seeing if we can extract uh, information across the different data sets. So how does data set one influence uh, data set two and so on. And so to do this, we developed a, a framework called uh, MOVE for uh, multi-omics uh, uh, variational autonomy. And I just have one slide here. I think it's super basic. I probably everyone or most of everyone here knows what it's, uh, what, uh, what it's about. But b this is really the basic uh, of our uh, method. So I really just wanted to uh, uh, just take a, uh, uh, this slide to talk about it. So we are using what's called autoencoders. They're very simple. You know, in general, they're quite simple. This is a neural network. We basically feed the data in uh, at one end, and we ba uh, basically um, would like to reconstruct the same data here at, uh, at the end, end of the network. And basically, and this is what everybody, or most people are, are doing then, this forces the network to learn like a latent representation, and this is what we had used, and also I think a lot of other talks today of, uh, in, uh, at the conference has um, also been focused on that. So, how does it work? Uh, it work? So, um, we have the, uh, the data here, so both the non-omics data and the uh, multi-omics data that we um, well, uh, feed into a, a, a model and where we want to end up having like a final trained model 
that can actually reconstruct this data. So this uh, we do by doing a lot of uh, uh, hyperparameter optimization because we want to get uh, the correct architecture. So we don't. So it's not we're not like trying to have, uh, to, to uh, transfer this network from somewhere else. We're basically training it on the data that we have. The second thing is that we then uh, do a little bit of analysis on this um, latent uh, space in the final train model. But where the really cool thing is is that we can we then came up with a, and this took some time for us to figure out, but uh, a method of actually trying to identify uh, cross omics associations. So basically, um, uh, trying to actually identify effects or associations between one data set uh, to another. So first, I'll just show you that yes, we can actually use this VAE to uh, reconstruct the data. So basically, here we have the accuracy of the uh, re reconstruction for each of the data sets out uh, on, on the x-axis, and one here is uh, perfect. We see here that the model, and this is like on um, unseen test data, so data it wasn't trained on, it seems to be um, uh, uh, very uh, much able to, to learn the data. Second, as I also said before, we could take a look at the relation representation. This is like a UMAP. Uh, of the um, of the latent rep uh, representation, each dot here is an individual, uh, and what we obviously, or what's the first obvious uh, thing that comes out is that it's basically that these newly ti um, diagnosed uh, type two diabetes patients, they are basically a, a con continuum. It's not really that that it's just separate cluster. Um, second, uh, what we show, and this is what uh, uh, here, uh, how these individuals has been colored. Uh, is based on uh, uh, on the insulin uh, sen sensitivity. We see here there's and maybe it's a little bit difficult to see on the, with the colors here, but basically there is like a, a gradient here from low in insulin uh, sen sensitivity to high, and this basically shows and means that our model was actually able to learn a clinical signature of the data. And if we just use the raw data, various other approaches to do um, uh, kind of integration or data uh, reduction, then there was really no uh, clinical signature. Also, we also show that we are able to reduce the effect of missingness and also on the uh, on, uh, uh, various uh, uh, confounders in the data, but I don't really have time to go into that right now. So let's move on to the second part here. So um, what we saw before was, okay, the models or the model can learn the data. Um, but how do we, so that means that it basically learned all the rules, right? So it learned all the rules about how does uh, features in one data set influence features in, in the other data set? But how can we take them out? How can we get them out? And, um, and uh, which basically um, it comes down to how can we extract these multimodal uh, associations? And what we came up with was, was to use uh, uh, virtual perturbations and then, um, uh, and what we investigated was then what would be the effect of a drug in the, uh, on the omics data in these patients. So to do this, these uh, virtual perturbations we used, or we um, we used the fact that the VAE is a uh, generative model. So here, over here, the the decoder can actually take information from the latent space and generate new data. And so, um, what we actually do with these uh, virtual perturbations is actually quite simple. So once we have uh, again here, we have these uh, my uh, example from before. Um, once we have trained the model. What we, what we simply do is we just uh, um, change the input for one of them, and then we pass the data uh, uh, through the already trained model. And then what we ask is then, how does the reconstructions then change? So when we change the input, how does that affect the, uh, uh, the, the uh, re reconstructions uh, of the model? And if you wanted to look at drugs, this is actually quite simple. Um, then it's basically just changing like the input from zero to one, right? So that in principle, what we are doing is that we are actually giving the patient a drug and then we're trying to assess what is happening with the, uh, with the omics data of this patient. Um, so um, the way we could then, so, so we uh, made this method for uh, identifying these virtual perturbations, but um, we also needed a way to ensure that what we find is actually real. 
So to identify uh, 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 significant drugs, drug omics uh, associations, what we do is simply that we, once we, we have trained the model, we pass the original data through, so we, uh, uh, to create some kind of a uh, baseline reconstruction, and then we do the uh, perturbation, and then we pass the uh, perturbed data through, and then we get a, a perturbed uh, re reconstruction. And then we can, and then we came up with two different methods to actually identify what is then a, a significant change, one based on uh, ba uh, Bayesian decision theory and another one based on various uh, hu heuristics around t-test. And also importantly, we had to, uh, we, we cannot just do this once uh, because the, these uh, models are uh, uh, st stochastic, so that means that we were actually refitting the model several times to be able to have a proper estimate of the um, outcomes. Um, I have a little bit of detail on this. I don't really think, uh, in the interest of time, I think I will skip it, but basically we have, so we end up training these, um, uh, training the models in two different ways. One, where we actually train four different architectures and we refit each of them 10 times and come up with a methodology to identify uh, what uh, a, a significant hit, and the other one based on uh, Bayesian uh, decision theory, uh, setting up two different hypotheses. One that um, says that, that the feature has an, uh, is changed uh, by the drug, and one that says that the feature is not. And then we can uh, compare the, uh, the probability uh, of the two um, hypotheses. So what I want to spend the last time on is then to show some actual results of this. So we applied this to this data set of the uh, type 2 diabetes investigating the effect of drugs on the omics data, and compared to using like, uh, you know, just a standard t-test, we are able to identify many more uh, significant associations at the same FDR. You see here, these are what are what's on the figure. These are all the 20 different uh, categories of drugs that are being given to these patients. And then the height is then the number of uh, significant um, uh, drug omics uh, associations. What I just want to give two examples. I know this is not like a, a medical conference, but I just want to give two examples of what we actually find. So here, this is um, here on, on the x-axis we have the drugs, uh, and then on the y-axis we have various uh, uh, clinical features. And uh, here I pointed out two uh, drugs: uh, uh, statins. So this is simvastatin and atrovastatin. They're used to treat high cholesterol, and what the model. Uh, identifies is that these are uh, highly associated with a decrease in uh, fasting LDL and cholesterol, which is exactly what these drugs actually do. Similarly, we also actually also identify an opposite effect here between the two drugs uh, on HDL, uh, which, is, which, uh, which has also been shown before. So I think that was pretty cool. You can also look at other omics data. So this here is the microbiome data. Metformin is like a uh, basically a very much used drug within the uh, type 2 diabetes. Um, here we find it to be associated with 14 different gut uh, changes in the, uh, or uh, yeah, with 14 different uh, gut microbes, three that have actually been shown uh, in, in randomized uh, controlled trials to be affected by metformin. So this, these are actually real changes. Um, and then, for instance, we also find for omeprazole, which is a protein pump inhibitor, it increases the pH of your gut. Um, and what we find here is that three bacteria from the, uh, from the oral microbiome are actually uh, found then also in the gut microbiome. And this makes perfect sense because if you increase the pH, then they're able to survive. So that was just some examples where we narrowed down. We can also look uh, across data or across the different uh, data set. So here this is like looking at what's the fraction of uh, of the data set that's affected by a drug. You see here that the, the uh, biggest um, fraction here is in the clinical data, which also makes sense. Like these drugs are actually supposed to um, impact the clinical data. We can look, and it looks a little bit strange here, but we can look at the, uh, that the effect size of individual uh, drugs across the different omics data and, and have a look at which uh, omics data are the most affected by the drugs. And um, uh, finally, we can also look at the uh, overall impact of these, uh, of, the, um, of the drugs across the different um, omics data. So we can kind of rank them and, and, and give an, uh, 
um, uh, impression of like uh, how much do they actually influence um, uh, uh, your state. So um, what we then learned here was that, oh, so this is kind of summing up a little bit, what we learned is that we can use these variational autoencoders to learn the structure of the data. We can uh, integrate various types of data, uh, most important data. We can deal with missing data and confounders. And we can use this virtual perturbation to identify cross-modal features. Um, and I then have like here a, a QR code. So we're actually uh, hosting an online workshop on multimodal data integration together with the Broad Institute. Next week is on Monday and Tuesday. And if you're interested, there's also like a small session with a hands-on um, uh, so that you can try it. Uh, if you uh, are interested. Um, finally, I also briefly want to talk a little bit about what we think about in terms of the perspectives and outlook of this, because what I think is really interesting about these kind of approaches is that our model is actually uh, trying to understand the entire system, right? And so basically what we did, we just asked a question of, so we trained the model, then we asked a question of it. This was like drugs to omics associations but we could ask any other question, right? We could also ask, like, what's the impact of a certain protein uh, on, other, uh, on, on the other data sets, or what's the impact of diet? Um, and one thing that I think that we, uh, that we also going for furthermore, uh, further in, in my group, is to, so here we only had, had 800 patients. So this is because these were, these were very well uh, phenotyped, but if we can uh, have access to, like, electronic health record data, for instance, then this is not uh, 800 patients, then it's hundreds of thousands of patients. And what we can then actually do is we can then learn um, these representations, or we can like integrate information across all these patients. Um, so it's in kind of like in this uh, uh, foundation model style, and then we can use this to actually go in and do like an N of one approaches where we basically say, so if, uh, if I then come into the hospital, uh, then it's possible to, using the data that's uh, already about me, what, you can actually test what would be the effect of a treatment, uh, of treatment A in this patient, uh, or what would be the effect of treatment B in this patient. And I think this is really going beyond just trying to find a match, which is basically what you're trying to do with this um, uh, 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 di di uh, digital twin or uh, patient like me. So here we are basically learn using the entire data, which I think is more interesting. I have to acknowledge a lot of people. First of all, my group, this is on the picture. Um, also the direct consortium which generated all this data. Uh, there's a lot of people from there. I think there are more than 100 people involved. So this has been uh, amazing data. From the University of Copenhagen, where I am, uh, Søren Brunak, who has been uh, leading uh, efforts in this, um, in this, um, in this uh, consortium. Uh, Rosa, who did um, most of the works. Also uh, Ricardo um, and several other people and then the funding from the IMI, so uh, European Union. Um, and I put up the um, QR code again if you are interested in the, uh, in the workshop. And also please, uh, you can catch me on Twitter or on uh, my emails and in the coffee break. Thank you very much.